Hello, Vox Vienna. It's a great pleasure for me to be here again in this beautiful city. In fact, I can tell you that Vienna so far is my favorite city in Europe. So you have a very beautiful city, very nice place. So that, that's why I'm, I'm twice as happy to be here because we have this great conference in a beautiful city. My name is Ed Yanaga. Uh, I'm a director of developer experience at Red Hat. My Twitter handle is at Yanaga. Just in case you want to follow me, I talk, I tweet a lot about DevOps, microservices, Java, software craftsmanship, and other stuff. And today I'm going to talk a bit about advanced pipelines for hypothesis-driven development because we want to make a step further. Uh, I believe that we, we might have already overcome the discussion around DevOps and uh, continuous delivery, so we might be able to take the next step further, more advanced pipelines. I'm also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP, which uh, used to be a weird combination, but these days, well, the world has changed a lot, but so far I think it's, as Google can tell me, I'm still, uh, uh, it's a still unique combination. I don't know for how long. And since we're discussing, uh, uh, I have to, to, to have the discussion about DevOps and microservices because in, uh, I, I need to get to you to, to the point and why are we using uh, DevOps tools and automations and processes and why are we using microservices to be able to, to achieve something. And in the discussion about continuous delivery in the past 10 years, we've been discussing about continuous integration, how can we automate our processes to take some steps out of our way for us to be able to, to simply deliver software into production in a predictable way. So, but, uh, and, uh, and in all of the teams that I've been talking to about continuous delivery and, and if, everybody, if everybody believes that continuous delivery is a good thing and we want to deploy software in a faster pace, so, but uh, I've always visited teams and the number one excuse that they always give to me when why can't you deliver faster is that we can't deliver faster because every time we deliver something into production, we break things, which means that we have too many bugs into production. And since we have too many bugs into production when we make new releases of software, we need more time for testing. But people don't realize that the more time they have for testing, the more time they have to code, and the more they code, usually the more bugs they have. So instead of releasing software every month, they start to release every two months, and then later realize that we have, we have even more bugs than we had before when releasing just one month. That's the traditional human way of trying to solve the problem of bugs into production, and that's the anti-economical way. We can do better. So the economical way of trying to solve these problems of bugs into production and trying to release things faster is trying to reduce what we call a uh, bad size. And technically the bad size in the DevOps world, to give you a, a complete scenario, uh, I would say that um, bugs in production usually are caused by changes between each one of our releases. And these changes can be encompassed in three different areas. You, you, you can have changes in behavior, which means you change the code. You can have changes in the state, which means you change data. Or you can have changes in your environment, which is the, the servers or the configuration that you have in your environment in which your application is running. Okay? So technically, the bet size between each one of the releases is this, this amount of three things. I want to oversimplify this concept a bit. I'd like to say to you that what causes bugs in productions between each one of our releases are changes in code. So we will oversimplify a bit. And the more changes in code that you have between each one of your releases, the more bugs you have into, pr into your production environment. So that's the human way of trying to solve that. The economical way is that instead of trying to increase the amount of changes, we're going to reduce the amount of changes between each one of our releases so we can have fewer bugs into production when we release software, right? And why is that? Because we as humans, uh, we need to improve the feedback loop in our software development process. And to be able to improve that, we need something called context. And for me, context is the amount of information and the, uh, the amount of time that you can hold this information in your brain. Because we as humans, we are very good in establishing correlations if we have the, the right amount of context in our minds. So if I, have, if I do something and I get this result, I'm very capable of establishing a correlation. Well, I did this, 
this went right or did that it went wrong but if i have too much information in my mind it's hard for me to establish m context because well i changed a lot of things uh, how do i establish it what thing in this this huge amount did i change that led me to this 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 result so it's hard for me if i have too much information for me to establish a correlation and again if i hold this information for too long like if i did something today and I'm only getting the result of these things into production six months later, it's very hard for me to establish this, this correlation. So for us to be able to, be to deliver better software and safer into production, we need to have the right amount of context in our minds, the right amount of information, and we need to hold it only long enough for us to establish this correlation. That's why we need to reduce our bat size. That's why we need to develop software faster. And this way, we'll be able to have uh, fewer bugs into production when we release our software, okay? So that was the basic discussion about DevOps so far. Uh, so the main goal, a lot of this, this DevOps and microservice discussion that we had so far was to try to reduce the risk of releasing a new version into production. So if you're not yet into this step, like I think I already have a fully automated software deployment pipeline, maybe hypothesis-driven development is not for you yet because you need to achieve this point and that the, the risk of the releasing software into production is very low um, up to the point that you can establish this correlation easily. I did this. I'm getting this result in production, and if I broke something, it's very fast and very easy for me to just spot the cause of the bugs, fix it, and release a new version into production. So uh, teams that have sufficiently uh, advanced, uh, uh, advanced uh, software deployment pipelines, they usually don't even have a rollback strategy because it's much easier for them to just roll a new version forward, uh, fixing the bugs that, that, that they just created into production. So that's the, the baseline that we have on the discussion about DevOps, continuous delivery, continuous integration, and something else. So far, we just uh, aimed at reducing risk. Now we'll reach to the uh, next step. And if you think about uh, these continuous delivery pipelines, traditional pipelines so far always focus on the next, next version. So uh, a traditional pipeline could be seen like this. If I have like a version 1.0, I'm coding the next release. Next release will be 2.0. It will be better than version 1.0. It will have fewer bugs. It will have more features. And we will improve my business results. Then you start coding the next version, 3.0, which again will be better than the previous one. So your path between your versions is clear. You're always getting the requirements from your next version, your coding, and releasing that into production. So the, the, the your, your, your trunk always goes forward. So this is a traditional pipeline. And in making an analogy about traditional pipelines, you can think about traditional pipelines as if you um, you have a restaurant, you have a buffet, and you in you have like all of the recipes for the meals that you want that you need to cook you just cook all of them and deliver that to production so your users or your customers can start to consume your food but if you ever went to a restaurant you can quickly check and assess that well some dishes that uh, people like more than other ones so you have to keep uh, refilling that that recipe more often while some recipes usually don't uh, don't get consumed that often for example broccoli and other like nice stuff usually they are left behind i don't know if you guys are fans of broccoli or not uh, in brazil we're not usually fans of uh, broccoli and and zucchini and other healthy things right so you have some dishes that people leave behind and other that people uh, um, uh, prefer so you have uh, this imbalance but still if you're at the kitchen you have the cook the do, do, to cook the whole recipe of broccoli or zucchini or or eggplants uh, and deliver that to the buffet because or else you don't have a full release right you need to have all of the buffet uh, fulfilled to get a successful soft release even if people are not going to consume everything right this is a traditional uh, software deployment pipeline so when we're talking about hypothesis driven development we can think it about it differently. 
So even if you're uh, in the kitchen and you want to cook things to your users, to your customers, maybe when we're discussing about hypothesis-driven development, instead of trying to fill the whole buffet, you can just start to create in small plates, small dishes that you can deliver to your customers. And instead of having to try to fill a whole pan with your recipe, maybe you can just give an, a, a, a trial to your customer to check if they want uh, uh, the food before you do everything. So if they don't want the food, you don't waste your time producing that recipe, right? You can s quickly switch to another recipe that might be um, better appreciated by your user or your customers. So that's one of the analogies that we have when we're discussing hypothesis-driven development. And when we make this analogy, I'm pretty sure that you might be thinking in your mind, well, if what, but how, that, uh, how does that translate into code? And if you're thinking about uh, the code, well, if I might have like two different things that I want to deliver to my user into production, and he, might he or she might like one or dislike the other, uh, the best, the easiest way for us to think about how can we materialize this hypothesis into code is to create, of course, a branch. So uh, the first strategy that we had to, to create hypothesis-driven development was, well, we have version 1.0. Now we want to, to assess uh, uh, this hypothesis. I'm not sure if users will be happier with, th with this feature or this other feature. Uh, the classic example that people give is like, if I change the color of a button, they know if I don't know if I'll sell more if the button is red or if it's orange which in my opinion is a very poor example, but it's, it's nice for simplicity. Because most of the times the greatest improvements are in algorithms. So maybe you want to change your recommendation engine, or maybe you want another algorithm for processing something that will lead you to better results. But again, when you to create two different hypotheses, A or B, you're not sure which one will be better into production. So maybe you just create A and B, you have two different branches of development, but version A didn't perform that well into production and you want to go on with version B. So we have like two feature branches. And again, a feature branching used to be uh, the default way for you to perform what we call A-B testing. And so people believe that A-B testing is very similar to like blue-green deployment. Uh, and uh, conceptually, in the server side, they might use the same architecture, but I think one of the main difference between A-B testing is that we are monitoring some behavior from our users and customers. We basically, blue-green deployments, again, blue-green deployments is a terminology from the DevOps world until now, and the goal of blue-green deployments was to reduce risk of releasing new software release into production. So I perform a blue-green deployment because the new version might fail. So we're not discussing about that anymore. We believe that our releases won't fail. Now we want to know which one will perform better. So we need to monitor behavior. And of course, uh, uh, I'm not talking only at, uh, talking about the statistics about uptime, requests per second or something. I want some behavior that is meaningful to our, my business how much, um, how much uh, transactions, successful transactions per second, how much money I'm making uh, per minute, per hour, per day. So this, kind of this is some kind of behaviors that we want to monitor. And discussing about these pipelines where traditional blue-green A-B testing is not enough, I'm going to show you some advanced strategies that some companies are using to be able to achieve this hypothesis-driven development. First one, is smart routing. So let me show you a small demo about that. Okay, you can see my screen. First, uh, as, as I said, I think this DevOps discussion is over. And you know that this discussion is over when all of the knowledge that you have on this area is consolidated into the infrastructure platform. So as of today, we can have a traditional blue-green deployment. This is a console. Uh, OpenShift environments, and if you want to create a blue-green deployment, you can easily. I have two different versions of my application running here. And if I want to create, uh, 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 a d uh, I call that a dumb A-B testing, but there is no um, consensus on this terminology, so I'm just going to create a new route, saying A-B here. 
and I want to say I'll say here that I want to split my traffic between blue and green, and I want that to be 50/50. So if or if I, uh, I'm just going to create that, I have a root, and here is coming blue, but you might guess uh, I hit refresh and it's always blue. That's why by default OpenShift is a sticky. So I get the new root here. Uh, well, got a green, a blue, how about another browser? Got a green, finally. Uh, so this is basic A-B testing. And I say it's dumb because basically what the infrastructure is doing for me is round robin testing. It doesn't, doesn't know anything about the client. It just gets one request, route to an endpoint, gets uh, the other request from another client, and issues to another endpoint. We can improve that because if you want to be smarter, if you want to perform like great hypothesis-driven development, we need to be able to profile and segment our users. So let me close this. And for that, we need something. One of the strategies that we can use if we're using feature branching is to use smart routers. And with a smart router, basically you get your clients, you put a smart router in front of it, and you have two separate deployments with two different versions from two different branches in your backend, and your smart router will filter and segment the, the, the connections from your clients to the appropriate backend. So far, the most popular smart router that we have in the market, thanks to Netflix, is Zoo. So what I want to show you right now is I have a Zoo instance running here in my machine. And uh, Zoo works basically like this. Uh, Zoo is a very simple application. If you dig into the source code, basically Zoo uh, is an embedded Tomcat server with some libraries for routing. And it dynamically reloads your uh, root configuration every by default every five seconds. And all our root configuration is written in Groovy. So it's dynamic. You just pause the, 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 the your folder every five seconds for new Groovy definitions. In the if, if anything has changed, it just reloads. It works beautifully on the Netflix infrastructure because they have a shared Cassandra file system. And when they write something, they change a new rule. Uh, this information is propagated through the cluster, and all of the Zoo instances can they, they can pull the file system and upload uh, update their routing configurations. So what I want to show right now, Zoo is running, but if you get here to see my root configuration, all of that I'm doing is that I'm just routing all of my requests to my blue deployment. So if I go to my browser and I try to access my Zoo instance, it's will it will always return blue for me. But if I just go here and just switch here, I comment the code, I save the file, I wait five seconds for it to be reloaded, I just go back to my browser and reload and it's green. Okay, forgive me, my machine is a bit slow because I'm running a lot of things. Uh, and later I'm going to show Istio a service mesh. So I have a lot of things running on, so it's behaving a bit slow. So dynamically just change the routes. And uh, okay, it's a very simplistic, again, example. But uh, uh, the important thing to think about Zoo rear here is that Zoo runs Java code or Groovy code in the application layer. So all of the knowledge that you have in your application layer can be applied here inside Zoo. So one of the nice uh, things that people use here at Zoo, in fact, the other example that I had is like, if you have mobile requests come from an iPhone, you can route that to a purple router. But as of today, even like dumb routing, like from, from infrastructure-based routing, can just get the headers from the your HTTP request and route that to appropriate backend. A nice way for you to, a nice thing for you to add here inside the Zoo code is that I'm releasing a new version because I believe that our service is performing poorly for a certain segment of our users and that the female users ranging from range uh, 20 and 25 that live in uh, South America. I think we, we, we need to improve because they have a different behavior from my application. So we want to test this new version uh, that I'm releasing specifically for these target users. You know, it's impossible for infrastructure to have this kind of knowledge, but since you're in the application layer, 
you just get the user that is logged in, you just get the he her profile in this case, you ju and you just point that to the r new deployment that you're testing, okay? So Zoo uh, is just like a way for you to add some beautiful ifs in your routing rules to get to your appropriate context. And this is the most popular solution that we have right now when we're talking about smart routing, which again, assumes that you're uh, doing feature branch development to different deployments of your application running into production. Now, but, but I have to tell you, be careful with feature branches because feature branches enable back again one of the huge problems that we had in the DevOps world that we tried to solve with so automated software deployment pipelines. We just get in everything back again. So, um, and why is that? Think about a feature branching. Uh, when you develop, you have basically you have the trunk which is the code that goes into production. And when you enable feature branching, which is very popular these days because if you get have a feature branch, you can just issue a pull request on GitHub or any other platform. So many people seem to like feature branches these days. But the problem if you're developing a project with, with feature branches is that, of course, I'm saying that you already have a so fully automated software deployment pipeline and you're using all the best practices for that. So even if you have a feature branch, you're constantly pulling the changes from the trunk to your branch. So like feature branch A and feature branch B, even though people are coding and committing to these feature branches, every single day or every single hour, people are pulling the changes from, from the trunk. Even when you're not doing that, maybe you're not do even doing that manually. Maybe your CI server is already doing that for you, right? It's constantly pulling, pulling the changes from the master. It's already executing the build. So if any time somebody commits something to the trunk that would create a conflict in your branch, you get a uh, you get you get a broken build and you are notified about that. So this is basically the best practice that we have with feature branches. But the problem with that is that when you're doing development in feature branch A and feature branch B, you're never accounting for the changes. If you're in B, you're never in accounting for the changes that people are doing in branch A. You're just getting notified by the changes that people are committing to the trunk. So imagine that you have feature A and feature B. You just keep developing these features for like two weeks. You have a lot of uh, different commits about that. And then somebody, somebody decide, well, we perform a B testing in production and feature branch B is good enough to go to trunk. So we'll just finish trunk, uh, feature branch B is going to be merged to trunk. What have you just done when you merge your changes from B to, to trunk? You created a huge batch size which consists of two weeks of commits and you deployed everything in just one, uh, one time to your trunk. Five minutes later, people developing feature branch A, they decide to pull the changes. And what do they have? A huge conflict. And in all of the teams that I've visited so far, when these kind of things happens, uh, the conflict so huge is such a mess that they don't even try to fix it because it will take like three, four days, one week trying to solve the conflicts. They just discard all of the changes that they had. They get the feature branch. They see what did I change here and they copy paste the code. Well, the copy pasting never sounds like a good approach, but that's what happens when the conflict is so big because you just created a huge batch size when you merged all of the commits from, the from uh, feature branch B into the trunk. So this is the one of the main problems with feature branches that we need to try to avoid. I don't know how many of you have ever tried feature branch in development, but it, it happens quite often. It happens to me, of course, uh, a lot of times. And that's, that's why I want one of the reasons I don't like this kind of development, I prefer to advocate for trunk-based development. Or if you need, if you still prefer feature branching, make sure that your feature branches are short-lived. Short-lived like one day or two days at most, it really depends on your pace of development, but make sure that they are very small so that your batch size can, can, can keep, um, keep short. And when you merge your things, your trunk, you don't just screw everybody's life 
uh, on that week, right? So feature branches, these are the dangers. So maybe we have another kind of approach for um, performing hypothesis-driven developments, and one of these approaches might be feature toggles. So feature toggles, again, is a very sophisticated name for uh, dynamic ifing approach inside your code. So it's a very nice name, but the implementation is kind of easy. And with feature toggles, we are doing trunk-based developments, and we're trying to employ one of the of the goals of continuous delivery, which is we're trying to uncouple release from deployments, which means that uh, traditional software deployment pipelines, um, releasing a new version of software or uh, releasing new features of software every time I make a deployment. With feature toggles, we're trying to achieve the fact that we're issuing multiple deployments and we dynamically can release the new features of our users and we can roll back these features too uh, at runtime. And how does it work? So I'm going to show you here a demo. First, let me stop my zoo instance. And I want to show here with code. Oops, uh, here, I'll exit this presentation mode. I don't need Zoo anymore. Now I need this demo. So I created a very simple Spring Boot application using a feature toggle framework, FF4J, which, uh, as far as my research went, is the most popular feature toggle framework being used in the Java world right now. So you use FF4J, it's very simple. Uh, has a very simple configuration. All you have to do is just create an FF4J instance. If you're using Spring, you can just instantiate the new bean. Uh, you, you define everything in an a XML file, FF4J.XML. And here you just declare, well, I have uh, this feature called hello. It's enabled by default. I have the description. I have also another feature, which is a new recommendation engine which is not enabled by default, and I have the description, which will be, this description will be helpful when I have this information at runtime. So if I go back here to my controller, which uses FF4J, basically I just uh, uh, add FF4J well, for dependency with the dependency injection, and I get here a check. If FF4J.check this feature toggle, hello, if it's enabled, I'll say hello, and if it's not enabled, I say, hello? Yeah, okay, sorry for my German. Uh, uh. So if I run this application, I can just get here and slash hello. I get my result, okay? Hello, so how do I change the information at runtime? Luckily for us, I can get here to FF4J console, which gives me this nice panel. I can go here to features, and you see, I can have these two feature toggles, and it's enabled by default. If I switch off the toggle, I go here to hello, refresh it, well, it was a very, but now it's in German, and now it's the right way. Eh? So, and switch back, flip back, and we'll just say hello. It's a dynamic. Uh, by default, the FF4J is storing this information in memory. Of course, in production, you will use a database or an in-memory cache like Infinispan or Redis or something like that. But uh, for demo reasons, it's just showing you here. But again, switching strings is a very simplistic Example, maybe we can show something more sophisticated. And what did I create? I created a recommendation controller, which basically when you get a request to that, you have a bean of type recommendation engine and returns to you your uh, recommendations. So basically, uh, I just when I want to test two hypotheses, I can just create another implementation of my recommendation engine interface. You see, it's just an interface. And if I go back here, for me to dynamically proxy this information with FF4J, I just have to say FF4J feature. 
a new recommendation engine. And uh, FF4J is going to flip the implementation for me dynamically uh, uh, on, on this controller. And how do I do achieve that? I just have to go to my FF4J application. Here I have one instance, a default recommendation engine. I just need to create another instance, which is improved recommendation engine. Return new improved recommendation engine. And I declare that by default as a bin. If I run my application as is, Spring will complain that I have two bins implementing the same interface. So it's going to have a conflict. So I have to tell Spring, well, one of them is the default, and the other one is like a spare one, which is going to be used by F4J. For me to do that, I just have to add annotation, which is a Spring annotation. Primary bin is the default recommendation engine, and the other one is going to be used by somebody else. So I rerun my application here. And it's running below. So if I go now to my recommendations, as you can see, I'm showing run right now some default recommendations, which are very poor. They are so bad that it screwed my Okay. So burger, soda, and hot dog, maybe you can improve this. So if I go to feature my FF4J console, and I decide that I want the new recommendation, turn it on, I uh, just get here, refresh, and I get much better food, right? In fact, it's so nice that I've been here at Vienna for two days and already ate this three times. So it's really good, yeah? You don't know how good it is until you, you're not from here. Okay, so that's how you dynamically change your beans using F4J. And again, uh, uh, up to my knowledge, F4J is the most popular feature toggle framework in the Java world, and some teams are using this successfully. But like everything in life, you have uh, downsides for uh, feature toggles. One of the largest complaints about feature toggles is that even though it enables you to have trunk-based development, you don't have feature branches, everybody uh, commits the code into trunk, is that uh, some if you're using the if checks, you have like this distributed if checks uh, spread all over your code. If people are using too many feature toggles and they forget to remove the ifs, you have a technical debt that you have to clean up later. So this is one of the complaints. And I've seen that myself in two of the teams that I've visited, is that people don't realize that um, uh, when, if you have like a large team and everybody's performing the, their hypothesis-driven development, in one team in particular, I've just visited that, and where they were monitoring the, the production results and they were switching the toggles, and well, we get these results. We switch it back, we get in another result. Then the next day they do the same. They monitor, well, we, we do this, uh, we do that, and they get different results. They assume, that, well, maybe it's the day of the week. Then they run that the other week, and they do it again, they have different results. What they realize is that in the whole team developing that, that, that service, you, had to, you have so many hypotheses being tested at the right time, at a given moment, that you have like 40 feature toggles being tested at the same time, which meant that no node of their monitoring was useful because every time we they were flipping the switch, you have like too many flips changed at the same time that you never get the something uh, um, meaningful in the end. So since they, they had a very large team, the solution for this problem for them was that nobody would be testing more than two feature toggles at the same time. But how do you do that if you have like multiple teams developing the same software? They had, unfortunately, to create what we call a, a feature toggle governance. They had to create another hierarchy of, the of, uh, of management. And these, uh, this layer would say, well, now this week we are going to test these feature toggles. And that's it. Then the other week we we're going to test the other feature toggles. So they needed to add like a governance to be able to schedule the feature toggles that they want to test. Not the ideal solution. But that's the way that they solved the problem so far. If you're using feature toggles and you have too, ma too many people messing around with the same code base, you they added some, a layer of governance. 
And the, the other solution for this problem of trying to perform hypothesis-driven development is that today we can think about using a service mesh. I know service mesh is might be a new concept for many of the for, uh, for many of us. In fact, uh, in this demo, I'm going to use Istio as the service mesh. As of today, Istio is not even production ready, but will be very soon because we have many companies investing on that. We have companies like Google, Red Hat, IBM, uh, Lyft, and other. Uh, and many other companies too investing in the uh, in the source code of of Vistio, so it will be soon it will soon be production ready. So basically, in uh, I don't want to explain Istio because uh, it's a long explanation, but basically what you can do if you have like a, a, a lots of services running into your infrastructure, you can add some kind of layer for governance of the relation between each one of those services. So if you're concerned about distributed architectures, one of your concerns probably is uh, tracing. You want to trace how a request uh, uh, comes from one node, goes to another node, then it follows, and when it comes back, how long did it take in each one of the nodes? And the traditional way of doing that is th that you need to instrument each one of your endpoints to propagate the tracing information. Uh, with Istio, you can, there are two different approaches for that. I'm going to describe only one. Uh, I'm going to describe the sidecar approach. You have the node proxy approach, but I'm not going to demo for you that today. So what you have as a sidecar approach is that if you're using a platform like Kubernetes, which has the notion of pods, every, I, I, and if you have in your pod, you have your application instance running, you can add another container inside the same pod, and this container will basically proxy all of the incoming and outgoing requests from your application. And what this proxy does? Well, in the default this implementation, you're using an Envoy proxy, which is a project, open source project contributed by Lyft, which is very small, very fast. It's implemented in C++. And in each one of the instances of your application, you have a, a sidecar container called Envoy. It, uh, if you want to add tracing, Envoy intercepts the inbound requests, adds the, uh, and uh, adds the tracing information to your backend. Then in the, in all the outgoing requests, Envoy again inter intercepts the request and adds the tracing information for your uh, tracing server. So you don't have to change a single line of code. You just go to the Istio configuration and say, well, I want in all of the instances of my application to have sidecars that will proxy and add tracing information. This is one of the things that Istio can do, but Istio can also add like circuit breaking. A traditional way of doing performance circuit breaking is add the circuit break in your code. If you think about that, it's just a, a distributed track catch. That's the traditional way. Istio can add a distributed circuit breaking, can add retries, can add pull ejection, can, uh, can insert faults. If you want to create your own chaos monkey, Istio can inject faults in your system to check how your system behave. How resilient is that? But talking about hypothesis-driven development, the feature that we're insta interested in the Istio uh, implementation is mirroring. Because we want to perform some, some hypothesis-driven development, but we want to play on the safer side. Uh, I don't want to release a new uh, feature in production without assuring that the, it will behave um, very well without impacting my sales. Or uh, even if I don't want to reach up to this point, I can like uh, mirror my deployment and just check the statistics for, the for this mirror deployment to check if I would have a successful output of that. And how does it work? So I want to show you first before discussing data. So if I go here, to my OpenShift instance, I have like three uh, different services, customer, preference, and recommendation. And I have two different versions. Uh, here I'm using um, feature branching because I have two different deployments in my uh, ba backend. I have recommendation one and recommendation two. And sorry for this poor interface, but it's all text-based. And if I execute a curl here, 
You can see that by default OpenShift will round robin my request between the two deployments. But what I want to end if I decided to let me increase oops my font size here. If I have two different implementations, what I want to show you today uh, is that I have this guy, let me check the logs, turn, recommendation. Okay, so if you can see the logs, I'm receiving requests. Uh, my counter is increasing, 62, 65, 66. And uh, let me just stop here. I'm going to create an Easter rule saying that I want to mirror. mirror. I want to mirror all of the requests from my version one deployment to the version two deployment. So version two will be out of production. So all of the requests will go through version one and version one will produce the results that will go into production. But uh, the Istio proxy, will the Envoy proxy, will generate a copy of the request, send this request to the version two, and we'll forget. So it's a fire and forget approach. It just sends a request to version two and forgets about that. So this is what Istio, do, uh, Istio does. So if I do this, I just created here. And if I occur again my service, you can see that I only get replies from version one, but version two is still getting the requests. So requests are being sent to version two, uh, but I'm being uh, uh, from, from the production point of view, all I get are uh, requests from version one. So this is the first thing that enables hypothesis-driven development with Uh, with mirroring. So I might be thinking, how useful is for me to get a mirror if I don't get to check the results of the outcome of this new version two, okay? So what I'm, what I'm going to discuss right now is like a bleeding edge is what people are thinking about today as what like many startup companies are implementing. First, the discussion is what about my data? Because I have a new production, a uh, new version or two different versions run into production and they're accessing the same database, the same data. How do I handle this if one of them might not be performing well, for example? So one of the approaches that you can do to for that is that you allow both versions to be running successfully into production. And I've described it some of the strategies that you can do with that in my, in my book. So in fact, chapter three, handles how you can have like two different versions of your application regarding to database schemas running to, to production successfully at the same time. If you want to get a copy of the book, it's in this URL or at my Twitter profile. But if you want to perform a third analysis of uh, mirroring, is that uh, I've done that before, like you mirror a service, then how what do you do to, ac to, to, to access the results of your, of your new version? You just get your production database, you restore a backup in another instance, and this version two points to the, 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 the copy database. Then you just check, well, just open your database CLI or, or your application and check if the data is being written correctly or if it's giving the results that you would expect. The problem with that uh, is that I've uh, 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 witnessed myself is that Creating this copy database takes a lot of, a lot of time. I've worked in, like in an environment that it, it took me like uh, 12 hours to be restoring a backup to be able to perform this kind of testing. And so it took a long time and you run for some time. You check that well. Uh, and and w as, the, as, the, as the day goes by, the, the, the databases, they differ so much that by the end of the day, it's not possible for me anymore to, to assess if the data is being written correctly because too many production tr transactions went here and here I made some fake transactions too. So I can't compare in a meaningful way both data sets. So one of the solutions that we're applying, trying to apply about that is to add a virtualization layer. So you can, uh, uh, that's the proof of concept that we're working right now. If you add a virtualization layer like Teed, Teed can so you can create uh, you can have your production database and you create an empty diff database, which will only uh, have the requests, uh, the results of the requests made in the uh, in the, um, 
uh, and the version two uh, application. So if you any inserts, updates, and deletes will only be recorded on the diff database. And uh, in this way, you can get your request. They can be processed on both backends. And if your new version is processing the request in a different way, you can just compare and see the results because the, the diff database, if you query that through the virtualization layer, it will still contain all of the production uh, rows plus the diff rows. So it's a much more efficient way for you to compare the data in both um, uh, databases. This is one approach for you to solve the data problem. And another approach, which is like very new, there is a, a project that was recently released by Twitter, which is called Diffy. In fact, um, uh, Christian Posta and Alex Soto, which just gave a presentation earlier this morning uh, for you, uh, they, 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 they've written a blog post about using Diffy to compare uh, different versions of your services running production using mirroring. And basically what Diffy does is that uh, even though you can't see the results of your mirrored instance into, uh, into production, Diffy uh, gets both uh, results. It sends the request, it gets both results and compares the results from version one and version two and then logs it, it into, it into its database. So you can compare, well, version one is giving me this result, version two is giving me this result and then logs it into its database. So you can compare the results of mirrored services. So this is another thing that is brand new. People are working on that right now. And another discussion is what about my other services? It's a s mirroring is simple. If you just have like the final endpoint, but if you're mirroring a service that, that is invoking other services, the scenario gets more complicated. And the solution for that is many people are using service virtualization, virtualization for that, which I don't think it's a good name for what they're doing. They are mocking like backend services in the mirrored service. I would prefer market services, but then I just realized that service virtualization was a term coined back in the uh, SOA world. So it is a term that has like 15 or 20 years and we're just reusing the same term here now that we're talking about microservices and uh, service mirroring. Okay. And that's what I had to, sh to show you today. Again, most of the mirroring part is brand new. Feature branching with smart routers and feature toggle is something that people are already using in production. Uh, mirroring is something that's, that is being uh, regarded mostly inside in startups and unicorns or companies like Twitter and Facebook and this kind of, uh, which have like very mature deployment pipelines. But that's what I had to share to you. Uh, we're uh, discussing all of these and we're publishing a lot of this information in, in the developers.redhat.com website. And thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, as you know, if nobody kicks us out of here. Hmm. What's the overhead of Envoy? And if I can use Envoy to monitor uh, that, that part of me, uh, outside connections like to other uh, other endpoints outside the cluster? Okay. Uh, by default, if you use, uh, oh, first first question is that, how is the how much is the overhead of Envoy? So uh, in our test, Envoy has a very low latency. It's a very small sidecar implementation using C++, but it's a network round trip, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's as small as it can be, considering that you have another round trip inside your inside your own uh, local host, okay? And for memory wise, I think Envoy consumes like 20 or 25 megabytes of RAM, which is pretty small compared to a JVM, but that's something that you might consider. Uh, if you have like 200 instances running into production, you have 200 copies too of your Envoy proxy. And if you're using Istio, by default, uh, the security model of Istio and Envoy uh, uh, Envoy blocks all outcoming connections to, to any endpoint outside your, your cluster. So if you want to allow your uh, application to perform outbound requests to, to, to nodes outside your cluster, you have to go into the Istio configuration and ask Envoy to explicitly, I want to allow requests to this 
domain name or these IP addresses. So yeah, this is the way that you can do it today. Yes, you can use it as an outbound firewall application for anything because, again, Istio is agnostic of uh, implementation. It's, it's, it's on the network level, so you can use it for Java, Ruby, C++, Python, PHP, anything that you want. Kay. Any other questions? Togo Z? Okay. I've I've tested Togo Z myself, uh, but uh let's say I've only visited I think three teams that were using future toggles uh, uh, with Java and all of them were using FF4J. And in my last project before joining Red Hat, I asked some future toggle frameworks too. And at the time was two years ago. Uh, I uh, we uh, our conclusion was that FF4J was a bit more uh, mature, uh, but uh, I don't have like I can't make a statement right now because I didn't look at back at Togo Z in the past two years. So I don't know if anybody knows the Togo Z maintainer. Maybe it's even more advanced than FF4J. I just can't answer for for that now. Any other questions? No? Thank you very much again. <laughs>